presentation or after or both. So floor is yours. Um, so can everyone hear me all right? And has everyone seen the uh, the main presentation screen, not my screen? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> um, so I did a literature review of uh, another review paper of the ab initio non-adiabatic um, molecular dynamics of charge carriers and metal halide perovskites, which is a mouthful, but... Um, so the motivation for the review for the study um, was for the application of solar cell technology. So solar cells based on uh, metal halide perovskites have been um, attracting a lot of attention because of their low cost, um, high power conversion efficiency, and their uh, efficiency has been increasing rapidly over the past few years. Um, and this high efficiency is owed in part to some of the amazing properties of metal halide perovskites, um, such as um, small exciton binding injuries, high absorption coefficients, large carrier lifetimes and diffusion lengths, um, and inexpensive fabrication costs. Um, so all those reasons um, help motivate why we want to keep continuing research into um, the materials to develop better solar panel technology. Um, and also other technologies as well that might go along with it. Um, so a little general overview of the review that um, I'll be going over is, um, it's all about excited state dynamics um, in metal halide perovskites. And there'll be a short introduction to some of the simulation methodology. Um, and then there'll be reviews of four different kinds of categories, um, influences of external conditions on metal halide um, perovskites, um, influences of defects on MHPs, um, photo excitation dynamics and 2D perovskites as compared to bulk, which were the two um, categories before, and then hot carrier fluorescence and cooling. Um, and then finally, there's just a kind of general outlook on perovskite solar cells and um, the simulation research in general. So for a little background on the simulation methodology, um, Non-adiabatic molecular dynamics describes the evolution of a coupled electron nuclear system involving transitions between different electronic states and uh, motion of the classical nuclei drives the quantum mechanical evolution of electrons, um, which influences classical nuclear dynamics. There are several um, mixed quantum classical approaches for modeling the dynamics. Um, there's the Aaron Fest dynamics, um, also known as the mean field approximation, where classical nuclei are propagated along the potential energy surface. Um, that is an average over the current, over currently occupied electronic states. And correlations of nuclear motions to different electronic states are captured by surface hopping approaches. Um, and recent reviews give a detailed description of the various. Um, non adiabatic molecular dynamic methods, um, which are listed there. There's a lot of information on them. Um, so one of the methods that talked about was uh, surface hopping. And in particular, they um, want to talk about fewest switches surface hopping, um, which was developed by a man named Tully and uh, called Tully's fewest switches surface hopping. And it describes the probability of hopping between electronic states based on solutions of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation shown on the right here. Um, and some of those variables are can be explained um, right here. So C um, represents the quantum mechanical amplitude for an individual state. Um, G is the hopping probability between states. Um, and the D uh, dot R is the non-adiabatic coupling, which we'll talk about in just a little bit here as well. Um, wait, 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 wait. Uh, oh, yep. just may interrupt in the middle. Yep. So what is A sub J K? Um, that is the uh, ex expectation value between 
or, or the multiplication. Yeah, I don't, I don't know for exactly sure. It makes me think of. Yeah, that's. I'm not sure exactly. Um, it's given here on the the right hand side. It's the the amplitude of state J multiplied by the um, complex conjugate of the amplitude of state K. Um, what I forget what the term for that is. My mind is blanking, but yeah, that's what it is. How does it connect to the methodology that we practiced previous three meetings? Um, I'm not actually sure. I, I don't, I, I'm not too familiar with the theory on it. In fact, that's one of the things I- Wait, 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 wait. It, it, it's not knowledge, it's thinking. Okay. So uh, in the, uh, an object with two indices, like object with one index is vector. What is the object with two indices? Matrix. Okay. So uh, wave function, absolute square, Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of wave function of uh, probability amplitude? And if we speak in the language of density function of theory, um, charge density. Density. Yep. And uh, C sub K, uh, C sub J are indices of contributing for different orbitals. So, if you, if you have product of two orbitals, it will be density, mm -hmm. but it's object with two indices. Which is that again? Object, mathematical object with two indices is a matrix. And here we have a product of two wave function expansion coefficients, mm -hmm. like product of two wave functions, which which gives um, a probability matrix. Or in this function theory, it is density matrix. Density, yeah, density there matrix. So A, J, K is density matrix, and uh, the surface hoping is uh, naturally connected to density matrix method that we practice. Okay. Please keep going. Yep, thank you. I hope it is, uh, it is okay to interrupt in the middle. Oh, don't, no, no worries. I, I do not mind. Okay, thank you. Um, so there is a recognized um, shortcoming with this approach and other um, similar approaches. And it's the issue of over coherence um, with electronic amplitudes. Um, and the origin of this is that um, non adiabatic nuclear dynamics treats nuclei classically and neglects their, their quantum aspects of electron nuclear coupling. Um, and the neglect of this typically leads to faster transitions, um, which is something you want to keep in mind um, when you're looking at any results from simulations using this, these methods. Um, an attempt to combat this issue is the Im implementation of decoherence induced surface hopping approach, which the, the dish approach, which they didn't really go over um, too much in the review. Um, and there was a lot to include. So I just kind of in included the reference if you wanted to look at it. Um, uh, and so the if you continue on the the coupled electron nuclei okay. oh can you go back and yep. give definition of decoherence yeah so decoherence is i i was always thought of it as like the loss of information as a, a wave spreads out in into an environment okay um can we give some Quantitative metrics of uh, decoherence. Say again. Quantitative metrics of decoherence. Um, I'm not sure. Let's go one slide back. Yep. The density metrics A sub A J. Mm -hmm. So if two indices coincide. What what would be the interpretation of the density matrix element? Uh, zero. No no no. Interpretation, not the value. If oh. two coincide. Uh, it's a, a transition um, between the same state. So. Or or. 
if you have two level system and uh, it is like sp spin and uh, your wave uh, it is in the uh, wave function one for spin down zero for spin up probably with amplitude what does it mean i'm sorry can you say that one more time <clears throat> term of volume okay. <laughs> suppose you have to a two level system mm -hmm. and wave function reads one zero for uh, one for first basis state, zero for second basis state. How would you interpret C one star times C one? Expansion for for eigenstate. What what is the interpretation of uh, uh, expansion coefficient absolute value square? Probability amplitude. It's just one number. Probability, but uh, if it is squared. I'm not. I'm blanking. I uh, don't know. Uh, if you have energy level. Mm -hmm. And you have the probability amplitude one for, for, for this level yeah. to be occupied and then you take the uh, absolute value squared one squared oh it's just one so what is if uh, you have just tell this word is this level occupied or not occupied if it's one it's occupied okay so when two indices of density matrix uh, coincide it is occupation or population of the level and everything that we discussed uh, last week was about population of uh, orbitals, right? Yeah. So what if the indices of density metrics do not coincide? Um, I'm not sure. It's a, it's a measure of coherence. Okay. And the speed of uh, decrease of disappearance of this... Uh, uh, of diagonal element of density matrix is decoherence. Mm -hmm. Okay, please keep going. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, yep. Um, I think I was I had moved on to this slide now. Um, so, and this is um, further equations. They, they couple the electron nuclei dynamics. Um, they can com can be characterized in the um, time dependent um, DFT by the time-dependent single electron cone Sean orbitals, um, whose evolution is determined by the um, time-dependent cone Sean equation. Um, and then just um, rewrite it essentially. You get the, the second equation. Um, and if you combine the previous equations, you get the equation of motion for the time-dependent expansion coefficients. Um, oh, can you go to previous slide? Yeah. Yep. So, why the lower lower line with equation? Why the coefficient c has two indices? What are the what are the two indices? <sighs> um. So. I'm not sure. No, just, just think. Uh, it's, no, I do not know as well. But what uh, uh, what what is the cat vector to the mo to the rightmost, like psi sub p? Um, right here. That's the electronic positions and the ionic positions. Psi sub p. It depends on electronic and ionic. But what is uh, it's the adiabatic basis of um, the wave function. Okay. Uh, can one say that those are eigenfunctions, like basis set? I believe so, yes. Okay. And what is uh, phi with, uh, without tilde? Phi P without tilde on the left? Um, that is the uh, linear superposition of the 
Okay. Um, I can I can say it's. Huh? Yeah, correct. Therefore, there are two indices. And do you see any errors in this uh, equation? Any errors? Yes. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know it well enough to, to point out any flaws with it. There, there are definite errors. Okay. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure of any. So. But, but uh, what is the summation index? Um, K. And. Um, to the number of. Right. Uh, and electrons. The. Time dependent wave function has index p, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not so summing over. If we p. find we find expansion of time time dependent wave function with index p over basis wave functions, and there there is index p once again. It's it's not right. Index p is uh, should be replaced with k because it, the summation goes over over basis functions. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. Please keep going. It's, it's all good. Um, so then if you combine the previous equations, um, you get the equation of motion for the time dependent expansion coefficients. Um, and you'll see in these, this, the second, or excuse me, the last term here in the first equation, um, that is the non-adiabatic coupling. Um, which is given down here by um, the, the second equation. And the non-adiabatic coupling is essentially kind of a measure of um, how likely a, an electron in a hole will recombine in a system um, between two different states. Um, and for in context with the solar cell technology, you want the non-adiabatic coupling to be low. You want that rate. Um, for couplings to um, be sh um, short or um, or you want you want the lifetime to be long, but you want the, the non adiabatic coupling to be small um, because that leads to higher efficiencies because the charge carriers last longer in the system. Um, so um, that is the non adiabatic coupling, which we saw earlier is the surface hopping is dependent upon. Um, and also that what we've been working on in in our group meetings as well. Um, uh, can I ask? Yep. <laughs> so in the first equation, what, uh, how the expansion coefficient C sub PK will change over time if non adiabatic couplings uh, are completely zero or if momentum R dot is completely zero? What would happen with... Uh, given expansion coefficient C sub PK? Um, it wouldn't change, would it? it would I'm, I'm asking you to solve the differential equation in your head and provide the answer. <laughs> well, it's um, the, the first derivative of C PK. Um, and so if that ends up being zero, if, if CPM is zero, um, that means the rate of change would always be zero. But if CPM is not zero. Oh, if it's not zero. Yeah. Oh, uh, I thought you were asking if it was zero. No, no. The non-adiabatic coupling D mm -hmm. uh, is zero, but energy of level E sub M is not zero. Okay. Um, so if the non-adiabatic coupling is zero, that means that the last term goes to zero and then you end up with just the product of um, those first two terms which i'm not sure how those oh, so if, if change the, but uh, uh, boston if derivative of a function equals to the function itself which mm -hmm. function satisfies this equation this uh, an exponential okay and uh is coefficient uh, of proportionality here uh, is real or imaginary? Look at the beginning of the equation. Uh, imaginary. So exponential with uh, imaginary power. What, what, what? How do you show it in in the air? How the function changes over time? Um, 
uh, is it decay? No, no. Uh, oh. <sighs> so it uh, is it real or imaginary? Imaginary. So um, absolute value well, doesn't change, but the face changes. So it's yeah. Uh, oh, so it would just it circle circle. Yeah, yeah, spiral in the mm -hmm. in the complex plane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Please keep going. Yep. Um. And then, in that last equation, that the first term, um, it's very expensive to calculate, um, typically. So you, one method that's often employed is the two-point numerical differentiation um, given by um, this equation here, which, and it's just an approximation, but it's used to save a lot of time computationally. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, there could be questions and uh, yep. everyone is, is uh, welcome to, to ask. So, is this right that you replace, uh, what is, this little triangle with a uh, subscript R in the first uh... um, delta. Yeah, what, nabla. What what it is? Or nabla? Yeah, I mean, yeah. What what, what does it do? Um, I forget them. Why am I blanking? Put on the spot, so I just keep blanking. It's um, derivatives, essentially, isn't it? Over which variable? Um, over the variables of the ionic positions. Okay, so it's gradient, right? Yes, great. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Yes, sorry. Oh, and in the lower, in this, uh, then you replace the gradient over positions by derivative over time. Can you explain why you are allowed to do so? I, I can't. I, I, I'm not exactly sure. You are. You are. It's, it's, it's. <laughs> um, Can you draw on, on the top of your screen? Uh, let me see Is if I can't get the annotation. Well, that's a laser pointer. Pen. Does that work? Yes. So um, what is R dot? Um, that is the time derivative of the position. Okay. R dot equals, or keep, keep. D, yes. That's supposed to be a T, sorry. D, R I, yeah, 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 it, it's fine. And uh, what is gradient? this uh, number sub r um that it'd be like for, for one dimensional motion for one dimensional it'd just be like um ddx or ddr if uh, it is r yeah only. can you yeah. write it down in front of your top line right here yeah not 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 gradient but regular derivative symbols oh is there an erase button here uh, do not waste time, just, oh, okay, good. Uh, um, so just regular? Yep. Okay. Now, if you know, if you have ability to erase, please erase the R capital equals. Okay, and now look on this uh, uh, thing algebraically, or maybe we can, um, ask uh, Samir. Uh, so we have a, are there any components, any terms that can be canceled? Are you asking me or, or Samir? Well, who, whoever uh, first, so. Okay. In the first fraction, it is d divided by dr. In the second fraction, is dr divided by dt. The drs could cancel. Yeah, can you just cross it by line here and there? Then it equals to this just, product d dt. Okay. Yeah. 
so you just proved that uh, derivative over space can be converted into derivative over time, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry for interrupting, please keep going. You're good. And uh, this equation that we all were practicing two weeks ago, no, three weeks ago for non abiotic couplings. So the files couplings dot zero zero one couplings dot zero zero two are uh, exactly what is written in the second line of the sorry of the equation by uh, <clears throat> Boston, which is I believe borrowed from uh, Hamish Schiffer and, and Tali. Okay, please keep going. Alrighty. So, and then one other quick thing that they they mentioned is that a lot of the simulations use a package called Pixade. Um, which it's used to do um, a lot of these simulations and it can work with VASP, Quantum Espresso, and other simulations, which I don't spend too much time looking into that since um, we're not using it very much, but um, they used it, so I included it. Um, and then now moving on to um, some of the results from their study and starting off with uh, non-radiative electron hole recombination under varying external conditions. Um, so just for a real quick background, uh, metal halide perovskites um, are, or have the chemical structure shown here um, where A um, is a monovalent organic or inorganic cation, um, B is a divalent cation, um, and X um, is a halide ion. And um, in this structure, distortions in, um, well, distortions in the structure can change the properties of the uh, metal halide perovskite um, from electrical properties to optical properties, things like that. Um, and so um, this is also just another quick graph of, or illustration of radiative recombination, non-radiative um, band-to-band -band recombination, and then um, D is auger recombination, um, just different processes where um, electrons and holes can recombine to um, stop be becoming charge carriers, which is what, again, what we don't want to happen in the system. Um, and so one of the things that can affect... Um, wait, 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 Boston, yep. sorry. Uh, yep. you to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to go quick. I've got, I've got a lot of slides. Yeah. <laughs> what do we, previous slide, please? Yep. So what are the pink and uh, blue boxes? Um, so those are the valence bands um, for the pink. And then the um, blue is the conduction bands. Um, and then the VBM stands for valence band maximum, the top of the valence band. CVM stands for the conduction band minimum, um, bottom of the conduction band. Um, and essentially, if to, to my understanding, is that the valence band is essentially, if an electron um, is in the valence band, it's, it's essentially trapped to um, the material. Um, whereas if, it if it's gotten enough energy to get um, excited up from the valence band to the conduction band, now it's uh, free to move around the material and can carry charge, um, which is, again, what we want for um solar cells okay and uh more uh general in ground state which band is occupied which is not occupied? uh in the ground state the valence band is occupied and um conduction band is not yep thank you yep um and so one of the things that can change some of the properties of um the perovskites is stress um, in particular, um, this study looked at tensile strain in the material, and it showed that as you increase the tensile strain, um, it will start to increase um, the band gap, and it does that by actually lowering um, the valence band maximum. Um, and that changes because um, the, uh, the bonds um, are elongated um, between the, the lead and the iodide in um, the perovskite, which this is looking at um, methyl ammonium um, lead iodide, um, which is one of many different kinds of perovskites that are, that are often looked at. 
Um, so this is one way you can modify the properties of the perovskite um, is by applying tensile strain. Um, and this is just a graph looking at the population, um, the charge carrier population as a function of time, um, which again, you want the charge carriers to live a long time. So a faster decaying um, population is um, undesirable. Um, so this shows the, um, ex the excited state population um, at different um, pressures um, applied to um, a perovskite, which again, pressures will change um, the, the structures and the bonds, um, angles and lengths, which will change some of the properties. Um, as you can see, charge recombination slows down um, under tensile strain. Um, and that's explained by changes in the band gap, which affect um, non-diabetic coupling and the decoherence time. Um, wait, 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 wait. Yep. Why, I, I, I missed it, why the potentially photovoltaic materials need, need to be uh, placed under, under high pressure? What, what's the reason? They don't need to be placed under high pressure. It's, it's pressure is one of those things that will change the properties. So, um, and it, it's shown here that placing the um, perovskite under higher pressure will increase the charge carrier lifetime was shown by the, the population graph here. Um, the, as, so the high pressure um, shown here is about 2.7 um, gigapascals. It has a slower decay of um, the population, which means the, the charge carriers last in the system longer, which means they're around longer to carry around that charge, which is what you're wanting to do in a, in a solar cells carry charge that's been excited from um, photons. So if you had a photon excite an electron and it decayed back immediately, that electron wouldn't be around to carry charge. But if it's um, that electron gets excited, sticks around for a while, then it can start carrying charge around the material, um, creating electric current. So one wants to squeeze solar cell to improve its performance? Yes, that's one thing you can do to, to increase the performance. <laughs> I mean, there's, 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 there's many different things we can, that, that can change um, the properties. So, okay. and this is just one. Um, and so this is just another graph showing um, the bond angle between um, the, the lead and the bromine um, lead ions and cesium lead um, bromine and at different temperatures. Um, and this is just showing how the bonds will oscillate. Um, and again, the, the bond length uh, of and the bond angle of the structure can affect um, these properties. Um, and so it was just got done showing how temperature affects those bond lengths. And so here's a graph showing how um, some of the other properties like um, dephasing um, is affected by uh, temperature as well as the spectral density. Um, and so if um, dephasing, that's, um, it's kind of a way, from, from what I've read, because I, I didn't really know what it meant when I was first reading this, um, it's kind of a, when a quantum system starts to um, obtain more classical behavior um, over time. Um, and I, I get that's something you, you might be able to explain a little bit more, but uh, um, I'm not, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but one of the properties that can be changed by changing temperature um, as is spectral density. Uh, there is a question in the chat line. Can you oh, answer? Um, let me pull up the chat here. Am I blind? There we go. 
Um, so Aaron asked, does the material go through phase changes over the wide ranges of temperatures um, the authors explore? And it was not mentioned if the material went through any phase changes, at least not over these, the two to 300 um, K um, range, at least not in the, the review, maybe the actual paper itself mentioned phase changes. Um, but the review of the paper, um, I, I didn't see anything about any phase changes. So no, I don't think that temperature range is um, wide enough for any significant phase changes to, to occur. Uh, Aaron, do you have a comment on, on it? Just that may help to interpret this. Um, not really a comment. No. So like perovskites are kind of soft and take different like crystal structures. So it's just something to keep in mind uh, when you're changing mm -hmm. temperatures that it's likely it will want a different like crystal phase as well. Mm -hmm. I, I did, in my research of this, I was reading other outside papers to try and make heads or tails of some of the, the stuff. And I did see um, some talk about different phases uh, of the crystals. So that, that is definitely a good point to bring up. I, I didn't see it here in this paper, but definitely did see it around. So mm -hmm. you expected that uh, at temperature above room, above 300 Kelvin, the angles between uh, bromine and lead are either 90 or 180 degrees. So it is uh, ideal cubic. And as one pulls it down, it starts deviating from uh, right angles. So maybe Aaron saw previous slide with angles uh, wiggling around and uh, made conclusion on that it is a signature of uh, yep. this transition. Um, and this is um, a plot uh, or, or an attempt to explain um, an abnormal temperature dependence um, of carrier relaxation uh, in methyl ammonium, lead, indium. Um, found that the fluctuations in the structure are more important um, than the nuclear velocities um, in determining non-adiabatic non -adiabatic coupling strength. Um, so even though non adiabatic coupling strength is directly dependent on nuclear velocities, it's the um, fluctuations in the structure actually influence it more than nuclear velocities do, um, which was an interesting find in um, the papers. Um, and these are some probability distributions of um, the non adiabatic coupling of a system and um, uh, band gap and some bond angles. Um, and it shows that um, the III or the indium Indian iodide, 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 not indium um, bond angle provides a better measure of um, non adiabatic coupling um, and band gap than the other bond angles do, which um, it's something to keep in mind when studying these materials. Um, uh, so any questions on that one? Um, so despite the unusual temperature dependence um, on the charge carrier relax relaxation in perovskites and bulk phase, um, the um, non radiative recombination at the interface between a perovskite um, and another charge um, transporting material that follows typical um, the typical trend that you see in other semiconductors. Um, so it it's the non adiabatic coupling increases um, um, as temperature increases. Um, at, at the in, um, junction and, but despite the increase in non-adiabatic coupling, um, stronger electron vibrations were shown to compete against um, the um, change in carrier lifetime and it results in a relatively weak temperature dependence. Um, 
but still influenced by temperature. So in addition to temperature and- Oscar, um, Can yep. you go back one slide? Yep. So what's the meaning of this graph? Uh, the graph on the right. So that's the non, um, uh, that's the non adiabatic coupling between um, different states in uh, the valence band um, for hole transfer across a uh, perovskite and a um, nickel oxide junction um, at, at different temperatures. So it's showing that. Um, the, the coupling is stronger at higher temperatures um, than at weaker temperature or lower temperatures. But why is the unit of your Z axis is uh, mainly electron mass? How? Um, that's a good question. I'm not actually sure on the units. Um, I don't know what, what the, why the units are that. So it, 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 it seems, uh, well, maybe not very reasonable, but understandable. They label uh, orbitals not by their absolute indices, but the absolute values of energies. That makes sense. It, it's not very helpful to identify any specific orbital. So this figure is only an average illustration of how big or how small the couplings are, but. Uh, Yun, does, does it make sense or, or still confusing? Still confusing, so okay, this figure tells you how strong the carbon is. The color code, so, um, X and Y axis are indices of orbitals in energy units. Yes. Assuming that they're very dense and the color goes from zero to 30 uh, mu electron volts in uh, natural color sequence. So we convert uh, the, through, through manipulation with units, one can express couplings either in uh, inverse time or in energy units. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. And this is an analog of the, uh, no, I think we do, we do not put couplings as function of indices because uh, they are very random. We first do average and then put uh, red field tensors. Um, so in addition to temperature and mechanical strain, um, the properties of perovskites, they're also influenced by um, external electric fields. And so these graphs show an influence of um, an external electric field on the energy gap and conductivity of a thin film. Um, and also the relaxation time um, of electrons and holes as a function of um, excess energy for the thin film under um, uh, different external electric field strengths. Um, and we can see here that the band gap increases linearly as the um, electric field decreases and the conductivity decreases um, exponentially with decreasing the electric field. Um, it's also seen that holes live longer than electrons um, at various electric fields. Um, because the conduction band is denser near the band gap than the valence band, um, which provides more charge phonon um, scattering channels. Any questions on this one? Um, and so the above res results show many things um, that it's possible to fine tune um, the lattice expansion and contraction to regulate um, bond lengths and angles um, to optimize photovoltaic performance of perovskites. Um, and it's also interesting to note how um, temperature will um, 
or how the performance will depend on the temperature of the perovskite if you're putting in a hotter place or cold place. Um, and that um, some of the photophysical properties will depend on um, ex external electric fields. So you can use all these things to kind of fine tune the performance of the solar cell in at least if in those applications. Um, and so that was the first section. Um, the second section is on um, defects and their influences on um, perovskite performances. Um, so any formation of real world materials will have some intrinsic defects in it um, during the, the creation of the material. And the properties of semiconductors um, and um, in particular, their electronic properties are very sensitive to the presence of defects um, uh, by changing some of these um, properties. And usually literature focuses on two kinds of defect energies, shallow and deep um, gap states. Um, a shallow gap corresponds to when uh, an orbital um, four bound electron is um, relatively large, um, 10 to 20 bulk interatomic distances. Um, and the energy gap um, between a shallow state and a band edge is typically on the range of a few um, kBT. Um, whereas deep states correspond to um, small orbitals and the energy gap um, is typically quite a bit larger than um, kBT. And essentially what that means is a, a deep state, um, if a electron or hole gets trapped in one of these deep states, it's very difficult for it to get out. Um, and usually they become recombination centers where um, electrons and holes will just recombine there, reducing their lifetime, which again is not what we want. We want them to live long. Whereas shallow gaps uh, or excuse me, shallow states are typically benign because it's pretty easy for a hole or electron to get out of a, sh a shallow state um, because um, they're much closer to one of the band edges. Um, and so defects can come in many different forms. Um, over here, you have a picture of quite a few of them. Um, there's vacancies. Um, and oh, these are just um, point defects. There's um, grain boundaries. Um, extended sur surfaces, clusters. Um, point defects are what was mostly focused on in this review, um, as well as a little bit of grain boundaries. But um, some of the influences of point defects were studied. And here's a list on the left of the different kinds of um, point defects. There's the iodine interstitial. Um, uh, methyl ammonium um, substituted by iodide, um, methyl ammonium substituted by lead, um, a lead vacancy and an iodine vacancy. And these graphs show um, the evolution of the valence band, um, conduction band and trap state energies for the, um, these defects as well as the pristine system. Um, and you can see on these graphs um, some of them are pretty intuitive that they'd be a shallow state or a deep state um, defect. So for example, the um, iodine interstitial um, is a shallow state um, as well as um, the, those other three listed, the, the lead vacancy, the molybdenum um, substitution, or excuse me, the methyl ammonium substitution and the iodine vacancy. Um, the uh, methyl ammonium substituted by iodine is a deep state defect um, with an energy 1.4 electron volts above the valence band um, maximum. And for all these states, the thermal fluctuations um, in the defects are much larger than the fluctuations in the valence band um, maximum and conduction band minimum. And so these, these states are where electrons or holes can get trapped in and then become, and then recombine, which again, lowers their lifetime. So typically you want to avoid those. Although sometimes they can be useful as we'll soon see. Uh, Boston? Yep. Uh, why amplitude of this energy fluctuations is uh, larger for defects? 
Um, so uh, is this is, is it yes. because that typically the defects are more mobile in the system so they can move around and then their energies will change more that's kind of what i what i was reading mm -hmm. um so this question is typically asked when uh, anyone from our community presents to physics community and here is the argument uh, against uh, our community if the model is experiencing temperature fluctuations at uh, room temperature, then the amount of thermal quantum should be KBT, which is uh, 0 0.025, 0 0.027 elder volts. Here, the amplitude of these oscillations is substantially like uh, 20, um, order of magnitude bigger or even more than the thermal quantum. Why? Um, because, again, what I was reading is because they're they're mobile, they, they move around more in molecular, during um, fluctuations in molecular dynamics. But I, I don't know the uh, anything more than that. That's just what I was reading. So um, it, it is, and, and and they're more easily broken. Um, uh, so, some uh, of the bonds. Yes, they they experience larger uh, amplitude of uh, elongations, the bond distances around the impurity, and the energy is not the um, just thermal quantum. It is uh, potential energy surface as function of elongations. So all uh, host lattice atoms um, perform collective motions of smaller amplitude. And if the same amount of thermal energy is communicated to just one or two interatomic bonds, they experience larger amplitude elongation and uh, they travel much further away from the equilibrium on the potential energy surface. But uh, what I'm saying is not the ultimate truth. It, the active search of the interpretation of this phenomenon is, is, is going on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have and... a question about the last study. So it's, so a lot of these atoms have charges, they're ions. So if you add and remove them, you change the charge of the model you're working with. Mm -hmm. So are all of these ones at the shore, are they neutral? Um, yeah, so there's later on, we'll see some studies where I believe it was, I can't remember if it was the iodine inter interstitial, the iodine vacancy, where they looked at different um, charges and their effects on uh, or, or different charges of the defects and their effects on the system. Um, so I believe these are all neutral. Um, I could be wrong, but that that's my understanding. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, so this is just um, an illustration of what I mentioned where the defect can become um, a trap where charge recombination can happen. Um, so the charges can get trapped in, in between the bands more easily and recombination happens there, again, shortening um, average lifetime of the carriers. Um, so this graph shows um, the recombination um, rate of different defects and what percentage of that recombination rate is driven by the defect and what percentage driven by um, just the direct recombination. Um, and it shows that for many of the defects, um, the recombination rate isn't that affected, although the um, iodine interstitial shows the longest lifetime. So um, charge carriers last longer um, with the iodine interstitial defect, which is 
good to know. Maybe it can be implemented in the system somehow. Um, so the similarity in charge recombination um, of the defects to the pristine system shows that um, the methyl ammonium um, lead iodine perovskite at, is a relatively defect um, or has relatively high defect tolerance. So they don't, the defects don't affect it that much. Um, and it, they said for other hybrid perovskites as well, will likely have the, um, a similar defect tolerance. Um, and so one major um, problem that um, can undermine the performance of perovskite solar cells um, is an inferior um, charge carry transport at contact layers. So from the perovskite to um, whatever material you're using for um, the contact layer. And um, in some studies they have done um, molybdenum, molybdenum sulfide um, and studied its effects because that's a pretty common contact layer and it's usually pretty good. However, um, the interface between the two um, shows um, that they have a large work function between them, which really slows down the whole transfer speed, which um, makes the solar cell less efficient. Um, and one way that they tried to solve that um, was through doping um, uh, with sulf sulfur vacancies, um, which leads to P-type doping, um, which decreases the work function. Um, and then with the sulfur vacancies, the iodine will diffuse across the interface to occupy the vacant sulfur site. Um, and this chain of vacancies will induce um, uh, a dipole moment across the interface, and which reverses um, or, or makes that work function weaker and allows carrier transfer to happen much faster. In fact, three orders of magnitude faster um, and making it a much uh, better um, whole transport layer. So with just some doping, you can significantly increase the efficiency of the system um, at the interface layer. Um, and this is, these are just a bunch of graphs showing um, different concentrations of doping and their effects on um, the systems um, at, uh, and they're all at 300 um, Kelvin. Uh, mostly what are the blue and orange lines in the uh, panels? In the first row or first column, I mean? Mm -hmm. um, those are the um, partial density of states of the blue is the perovskite and the orange is the um, interface, um, the molybdenum sulfide. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's partial density of states and it shows that as you increase um, the doping, they, the gaps um, get smaller and smaller. So we are, we are looking only on the uh, valence band edge. Um, yes. For, yes. For whole transfer. Mm -hmm. Is it correct that uh, the molybdenum sulfide is always occupied uh, orbital with higher in energies than perovskite? Um. The, so that orange is always higher than blue yeah, yeah. for negative energies below Fermi energy. Yep. Um, uh, looks like blue blue is higher than the molybdenum. The, in, in energy, not in the heights. Not, oh, not I, I, see, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. So the direction of charge transfer is always from perovskite to uh, molybdenum sulfide. Yeah. Okay. Um.
Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Um, so even though some of the point defects in systems um, can be detrimental to the carrier lifetimes, um, they can often be um, neutralized or passivated um, using um, impurity doping. Um, so for example, um, the iodine vacancy um, in the methyl ammonium um, perovskite is um, a shallow donor, but it can become um, a deep acceptor when it is negatively charged. Um, and that creates, again, the problem of shorter carrier lifetime. And it, it was found to be, er, the uh, methyl ammonium perovskite was a found to be extremely sensitive to um, this charge state of the iodine vacancy um, with the um, negative one ion increasing um, charge recombination rate by several orders of magnitude, um, which is again, not good. Uh, but they found that um, in the, the, the vacant system, um, two lead um, ions um, will approach each other and form a bond and um, create um, a deep level in the band gap, um, which again acts as the, which is the recombination center for the charge carriers. Um, so knowing that some doping um, trials were carried out, doping simulations um, with bromine um, were carried out. And bromine is more electronegative um, than iodine and can um, thus strengthen the chemical bond with um, the lead, um, which mitigates the defect states. Um, and these graphs show electron hole recombination um, channels for the um, iodine, the negative iodine vacancy um, defect in um, pristine uh, methyl ammonium perovskites um, and the doped uh, methyl ammonium perovskites. Um, and then the evolutions of the populations of the key states um, are shown as well. And they show that the bromine doping extended the carrier lifetime from uh, 3.2 nanoseconds to 19 nanoseconds, which is a pretty significant increase. Um, so uh, again, the bromine doping can um, increase the carrier lifetime, which is again, good for the system. Any questions? So what are these defect states? You have defect state one, two, three, right? Um, yeah, so those are the, if I remember right, I thought I had the notes written for this one. I must not have done that. Those were the, um, different, um, levels that are created in the system by, um, the defects and with the doping, you get rid of um, some of these deep states and you create a shallow state. Um, so, and those are just the different states in the different systems um, created by, so that like the DS1, um, the DS2, um, those are shown in the diagrams to the left. Um, I don't, um, not, I'm not for sure um, if you need any more than that, but that, that, that's what I know. Okay. And then the different recombination methods can be are, are shown in the A and B as well. Any other questions? Alrighty. Um, and some similar research has shown that um, you can pass, passivate the iodine interstitial defect in methyl ammonium perovskites um, with alkali ions. Um, and it was demonstrated that the um, monovalent alkalis bind strongly to the interstitial iodine. And as a result, the energy of the formation 
um, increases and which decreases the, con um, uh, the concentration of the defects. And so again, you can see here um, the population rate changes or population changes um, of the different systems. And again, um, adding some of these alkali ions will drastically slow down the um, recombination rate, which increases carrier lifetime. Any questions for here? Um, and then even more similar work has shown that um, alkali dopancing of the iodine vacancy um, defect in methyl ammonium um, perovskites can eliminate um, trap states and decrease the charge carry combination rate. Um, and these graphs show the projected density of states um, for the defective um, perovskite um, containing iodine vacancy without and then with um, lithium doping. Um, and then there are many other methods of defect passive, um, passivation that have been tried and um, shown to be successful. And all these different methods are good starting points for future researchers and engineers to um, design uh, more efficient um, perovskite solar cells. And question for here. All righty. Um, and so um, in the perovskites with defects, the defect migration has been um, identified as um, the origin of some, some anomalous properties of perovskite solar cells, um, such as low photoconductivity response, um, current volsatisteresis, and um, a few others. And the predicted energy barrier for um, iodide migration is about um, 0.16 electron volts, um, which gives um, a migration rate of 7.7 .7 times 10 to the negative 10 um, per second, um, according to the Ar um, Arrhenius equation. Um, and the ion migration time falls into the range of non-radiative carrier lifetimes in um, perovskite solar cells. And the similarity in the time scales raises the question of whether the two processes um, influence each other. And so investigations were carried out into that, um, uh, into the possible synergy between um, ion migration um, induced lead iodide lattice distortion um, and charge carrier recombination. Um, and it was conducted in methyl ammonium um, lead iodide. Um, and you can see after the start of an iodide ion migration, um, the non-adiabatic coupling value reaches its maximum value at about um, two picoseconds and reaches a second maximum at about three picoseconds. And those are both very close to the two peaks in the distortion curve, um, which indicates that strong distortion in the system um, is related to the increase in non-adiabatic coupling, um, which um, helps explain some of these um, anomalous um, behaviors of perovskite solar cells. Um, and they, the results demonstrate that the processes um, are strongly um, correlated in um, perovskite solar cells. And defects considered benign for equilibrium ge geometries can be detrimental under non-equilibrium conditions as the defects migrate through the system. Um, do you have a question for this slide? Why they introduce Arrhenius equation here? Are they trying to compute the activation energy? Um, they use that to compute the migration rate, I believe. Um, that's what they, they, they said they used. Um, and that migration rate was found to be um, very similar to um, the uh, non-radiative carrier lifetimes. So how did they calculate the energy barrier for the LD migration? I'm not exactly sure. That's just what they, they, they said they used. 
Um, I'm not that familiar with the Arrhenius equation myself, um, although it looks relatively simple. Um, so, but that's that's what they, that's what they use in in, in their report. Uh, maybe someone else has a more insight into that. Okay. So, sorry, I can't answer answer that any better, but it seems to have analogies with the project that uh, Raju at the group of uh, Professor Tihan Zhang is, is, is doing, right? With lithium migration and using Arrhenius to assess it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about? this slide or uh, any previous slide. Alrighty. Um, and so those were all talking about just point defects in the perovskite systems. Um, there are many other kinds of defects. Um, one of the other um, kinds of defects that were explored were grain boundaries. Um, and so initial experiments were um, suggested that grain boundaries are detrimental to the charge carrier lifetimes um, in methyl ammonium um, lead iodide. However, the very, a lot of first principle simulations um, have shown that grain boundaries create no charge trap states and um, that the non-radiative um, recombination happens primarily along the non-grain boundary regions. And all, the other experiments have also shown that um, grain boundaries and hybrid perovskites um, actually facilitate facilitate charge trip separation and transport, um, which conflict against some experiments. Um, so they raise a lot of questions about um, the nature of grain boundaries um, in determining the prov uh, the perovskite solar cell performance. And so some investigations were carried out um, into the um, recombination dynamics along the um, grain boundaries of uh, methyl ammonium um, perovskites. And um, this is just a depiction of um, the perovskite um, at pristine and um, grain, with grain boundaries um, at different temperatures. Um, And it was found that um, the grain boundaries of the methyl ammonium perovskite um, um, that has a decreased band gap and shallow defect state um, with localized electron and hole wave functions. And the re reduction in the, the crystalline symmetry and the shallow trap states helped separate electrons and holes um, and activate um, a broad range of um, phonon modes to couple with charge carriers. Um, and despite a stronger um, electronic um, vibrational interaction and smaller band gap, um, the decreased overlap of the electron and hole wave functions reduced um, the non adiabatic coupling, um, which maintained the um, excited state lifetimes um, in the grain boundary system as compared to the pristine system. So it shows that the, the grain boundaries don't really have that large of an effect on the carrier lifetimes, um, at least in um, the methyl ammonia perovskite. Um, so that's a pretty interesting result. It actually conflicts with a lot of uh, um, experimental evidence. So um, any questions about this one? Um, did they only look at that one, like specific grain boundary? Uh, yeah, that, that was the only grain boundary that um, they talked about, at least in this paper. Um, they may have looked at um, other, um, other grain boundaries in other papers, but um, just this one um, in this paper. Any other questions? And so that was it for defects. Um, and so now we're on to 
um, the photo excitation and 2D perovskites. So most of what we've been talking about before were applicable to um, bulk systems. Um, this is um, for 2D systems. Um, and the reason for study into it is because 2D perovskites um, show um, much higher um, environmental stability than um, their 3D counterparts, um, which makes them much more viable, uh, or at least not um, much more desirable um, in many applications. Um, unfortunately, the um, photovoltaic efficiency of the 2D perovskites is still relatively low um, for because of low absorption coefficients, um, exciton binding and um, large exciton bi binding energies and poor out of plane charge transport. Um, so studies to um, improve their performance um, tend to focus on lowering the band gap and reducing um, the um, non-radiative um, electron hole recombination rates. Um, so the photophysical properties depend significantly um, on the long chain spacer cations in um, the 2D perovskites. Um, there are, there were um, a few different um, perovskites, uh, 2D perovskites looked at um, with um, BA, uh, I, I, I don't know what, what the, the term for it, if it has a nice name, um, but the, the formula is shown down there. Um, PEA um, also shown down there and three amp. Uh, Boston? Yep. Uh, let's ask uh, David if he's uh, online to help with the names. David, would you like to help to us to learn how to pronounce this B A and P A? I I know they have names, but I don't off the top of my head know what they are. <laughs> Come on, I, I I'm a hundred percent confident you you know these names. So, um, what's the natural progression of hydrocarbons? Like methane, ethane, can you? Oh, that the, the BA is butyl ammonium. Okay, because there are like four carbons, right? Yeah, four carbons. That's butyl. Um, C6, H5, C2. Phenol ethyl ammonium would be the PEA. Yes, and C6, H5. C6, uh, H5 is phenol. Okay. So it's a, it's a benzene ring, but you're connecting something to the benzene ring. So it is like phenyl ethyl ammonium, right? Yeah, phenyl ethyl ammonium. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, Boston, please, please continue. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then um, I do know the uh, the third one is amino ethyl piperidinium. Um, and so those are the ones looked at. And it shows the um, excited state, um, or the, the probability distribution, um, and the absolute instantaneous non-adiabatic coupling with magnitude larger than um, 1.5 uh, mill electron volts um, on these graphs. Um, and so the um, three amp spacer cations. Um, they tend to lead to delocalization of the band edge. Um, charge densities um, and smaller um, non-adiabatic coupling, um, which suppresses the charge recombination, which again is good. Um, so um, that one seems to be um, a leading contender as a spacer cation in the 2D um, perovskite systems. Um, and so here's just a depiction of some um, valence band um, maximum um, and conduction band minimums, um, charge densities for some of the systems. Um, and then the some simulations comparing um, the hot electron um, cooling dynamics in the 2D layered perovskites um, compared to 3D um, perovskites were conducted. Um, and these graphs show some of the um, averaged um, absolute um, non adiabatic couplings in. Um, oh, yep. Uh, can we scroll? Uh, uh, I apologize, I didn't have a breath to 
to stop er error. Can we go a couple of slides back with images? Uh, enough. So there is a question from Steven Wester. Mm -hmm. He's asking if the, no, 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 forward. Oh, oh, this one, okay. Yeah, this one is perfect. So it uh, shows this butyl ammonium and uh, phenyl ethyl ammonium, right? Mm -hmm. So with uh, carbon chains and this uh, aromatic on the top and uh, aromatic ring in the bottom. And uh, Steven is asking if those spacers are charged because he noticed mm -hmm. by his uh, good eye that nitrogen has uh, four bonds, one to carbon and, and three to hydrogen. Uh, yeah, they are charged. Um, they're uh, plus one. Um, and why charged species are needed? Um, say again? Why charged species are needed in these structures? Um, now that's that's a, a good question. <laughs> I don't know why um, why they're needed. Uh, uh, David, would you like to help? Brassicates are an ionic species. So the ammonium ammonium bonds with the, I think you said these were iodine mo models? Yep. So it will bind with the iodine and the tails will, the organic tails will form like a hydrophilic la layer. That's what gives you your quasi 2D structure. Okay. So uh, they need to balance the charge. The lead and iodine form lattice where each lead has uh, six iodine neighbors and form stable octahedral lattice. But then uh, lattice two plus iodine is uh, one minus and there is no way to form periodic structure with zero charge. They need additional plus charges to make it uh, neutral. Okay. So Steven, thank you. Thank you for inducing the discussion. And, and Boston, sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, no worries. Yes, so I, I see now that there are three hydrogens on this. It's a little hard to see white on white. Yeah, the some of these graphs were small too. and didn't show up very well, but um, so where was I? Uh, some simulations um, comparing the 2D perovskites to 3D perovskites were conducted. Um, and so these graphs um, show the uh, non-abiotic couplings um, in um, the 2D perovskite and the 3D perovskite. Um, and the 2D perovskite has um, a higher average non-abiotic coupling, um, which means the charges will recombine faster. Um, and uh, um, short, have shorter charge carrier lifetimes, which again is bad for the system. Um, so those are just some results. And here's just another image of um, the structure. Um, Um, and here is um, a graph showing the the spacer cations in the um, the two D perovskite and um, the the um, what was it? Remind me again, David, what the BA was? <laughs> butyl ammonium. Butyl ammonium. So the the butyl ammonium um, spacer cations. Um, coupled more strongly to the um, lead iodide um, sublattice, leading to the deformation of the um, structure, and which enhanced um, the electron um, phonon interactions. Um, and so this graph just kind of shows trajectories showing um, some of the bond lengths um, uh, and, and how they change. Um, that's one of those graphs that I'm gonna be honest, I didn't follow exactly um, or, or very well, but maybe someone else can ex explain that one a little bit better. 
it's a challenging graph, but at least can you uh, maybe help us to navigate what is the beginning, where is the end? What is the general direction of trajectory? And can one tell something that distance between species increases or just fluctuates? Um, so... Uh, the arrows, do they yeah. show initial and final uh, points of the trajectory or it is something different? That's actually a good question. I'm not sure what the arrows show. They weren't listed in the um, description. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, then you can focus on it later if, right. if you ever come up. So um, it was found that e electrostatic um, charge screen influences um, the behavior of the um, photogenerated charge carriers in the 2D perovskites. Um, and so studies were conducted on the charge screen effect and the role that that has, or in the role that a large dielectric constant has on um, in regulating um, electron cooling rate. And so the spacer cations studied were um, listed there. And the figure shows um, the hot electron relaxation and electron hole recombination um, processes um, after a high energy excitation. Um, and so high um, dielectric constant spacers were found to um, exhibit slower electron um, cooling compared to low dielectric constants. Um, and these graphs show the averaged um, absolute non-ebitic coupling in mill electron volts um, and the hot electron relaxation dynamics in um, uh, the, the 2D systems with different spacer cations. Um, and it showed that the, the larger dielectric constant of the spacer cations um, better screened the Coulomb interactions between electrons and holes, um, which led to smaller um, non abiotic coupling um, and slower charge recombination rates, um, which is, again, desirable. So spacer cations with large dielectric constants um, seem to be a good idea at least for this application. Um, and the effects of the local electric order on non-radiative electron hole recombination um, in uh, a ferroelectric lead halide perovskite were also studied. Um, three phases were studied, the ferroelectric, um, the mixed and the antiferro where the CN bonds were fully aligned, um, mixed and anti-aligned. And these graphs show the correlation of the band gap um, versus the non abiotic structure for um, the different systems. And the non abiotic coupling strengths vary due to the charge separation um, induced um, by the cation ordering. And the ferroelectric phase showed a weaker non abiotic coupling and a larger band gap, which again led to slower um, carrier recombination. Um, and one other thing that was studied um, was the effects of, um, or the yeah, electron hole recombination dynamics um, for the bulk um, edge and the edge star, which is the Homo minus one, luma plus one transitions. Um, and here's the graph showing those. Um, and here is another diagram of a homo and lumo charge densities for some of these um, uh, 2D perovskites. And so that was it for the 2D perovskites. And on to the, the last section um, of hot carrier fluorescence and cooling. So in photovoltaic cells, um, the absorption of a photon 
um, with an energy larger than the um, band gap can produce um, hot carriers, which will then re um, relax to the valence band maximum or the conduction band minimum um, by exchanging energy with phonons. Um, being able to harvest the hot carriers um, can drastically increase the efficiency of the solar cells um, uh, as compared to just um, cold carriers. Um, however, the carrier thermalization process in um, perovskites typically occur on a time scale of a few hundred femtoseconds, um, at least according to the um, ultra fast time resolved um, spectroscopy characterization. Um, and the sub picosecond cooling times for hot characters make um, actually extracting them extremely challenging. Um, and so some studies were conducted on them and they found that hot carrier cooling in the perovskites can be tuned um, with compositional engineering. Um, so a study of the methyl ammonium perovskite um, with and without um, chlorine doping was conducted. Um, these graphs show um, visualization of the non abiotic coupling in mill electron volts between um, uh, states in the um, uh, in the space of the KS orbitals um, indices for um, the pristine and the doped system. Um, and for the pristine um, system, the electron and hole cooling occurred within about um, 700 femtoseconds. Um, with hole relaxation occurring um, faster than the electron relaxation. Um, in the chlorine doped um, system, it increased the difference between um, the hole and the electron cooling rates, um, but importantly extended both cooling times. Um, so chlorine doping um, extended the hot carrier um, lifetimes in the system, which is again, good. Um, and cation mixing is also a viable method of um, regulating um, carrier cooling rates. Um, so these graphs show some cooling times of hot electrons and hot holes um, as a function of uh, excess energies in cesium um, perovskite. Um, the uh, Fa perovskite, which again, I forget what that name is. I think I had it listed earlier. Um, on, but, uh, uh, and then the methyl ammonium perovskite. Um, For my video. Say again. I'm not able to draw this uh, chemical structure, but it, it sounds like for my medium mm -hmm. and it may have uh, like symmetric nitrogen in the middle and carbon to, to the sides. And so it was found that the, the larger size um, uh, cations are more likely to interact with the um, inorganic lattice, which leads to deformation in the um, octahedra. And, um, but in the cesium um, perovskite, these were, it, this was insignificant. And these interactions will change the non beta coupling and the phonon modes. Um, that and uh, um, it, that are participating in the non-radiative um, relaxation, um, and so um, though that's another thing that can um, significantly affect how efficient your systems are. And so for um, the uh, methyl ammonium and the um, uh, again, FA1, I <laughs> struggle to remember that name. The strong coupling of the um, um, cation libration and the torsion modes um, to low frequency modes um, associated with the, the lead and the um, iodide um, that facilitated um, the non radiative character relaxation. Um, and this was further supported by the considerable slowing of hot carrier cooling um, when the organic cations are artificially frozen frozen, which is shown um, on the right. So when they were free to move around and um, interact with the octahedron, um, that's what they were suspecting was causing um, a larger coupling. And so when they froze them and the coupling reduced, it's um, pretty solid support for that idea. 
Um, and so some other experiments that were conducted showed that there was some high energy fluorescence in um, a hybrid organic um, inorganic perovskites, which corresponds to uh, long lived hot charge carriers, um, which is again, a good thing you want long lived um, charge carriers. Um, and they suspected that reorientational motions of um, the dipolar methylammonium molecules influence the emission energy and carrier lifetime, um, particularly the methylammonium um, led bromine um, exhibits higher and lower band gap structures depending on the methylammonium orientations. Um, the higher band gap structures have aligned methylammonium cations. Um, and whereas the lower band gap structures arise from um, um, uh, or excuse me, yeah, um, the, the lower band gap structures arise from small polarons, um, whereas the high band gap structure arise from large polarons. Um, and then the electron and whole wave functions of large polarons in the higher band gap structures are delocalized, which lead to a larger non adiabatic coupling and faster. Um, charge recombination, um, which is responsible for the um, fluorescent decay. And these are some graphs of the um, population um, as a function of time of the two systems. Boston, oh, yep. can we glance once again and what's the definition of small polarons and large polarons? And probably uh, let's try and if uh, we make any deviations from true definition, Aaron will correct us. Um, so, I'm not exactly sure what the polar runs are. I, um, yeah, I, I know I, I, I had read about them, but now I've forgotten already. Um, yeah, and I didn't write it in my notes, so. So how would you formulate the question to, to Aaron? Uh, I, I would ask, what, what is a polar on? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Aaron has a right to say just, uh, you should have listened to me uh, a week ago, but would you please re repeat uh, the definition? Yeah, so it's it's when the like your electron density, so those yellow blobs mm -hmm. interact with the lattice. So it's your charge density has a charge, and your lattice has a charge, and they can mm -hmm. like orient around each other. And so yeah, it's like the base. It's like the most general idea of a polaron. Okay, and then a large polaron is just when your density is spread out over. More than one unit cell. So like the top two would be, I guess you could call large polarons. And then the bottom row, like your density is basically local, localized to like one atom. So that would be a small polaron. Okay, yeah, that, that rings a bell now. Now I remember. Thank you. Um, and so one of the last things that was mentioned in the study are, are um, quantum dots, which are another interesting area of research in um, metal halide perovskites. Um, and so confinement of the charges in the quantum dots um, generate atom-like um, quantized spectral signals. Um, and this effect will strongly depend on the quantum dot size. And generally smaller quantum dots have larger level spacing, um, which um, can suppress um, carrier thermalization. Um, and this is, these two graphs just show um, a diagram of the um, valence band and conduction band and how their simulation was done. They artificially injected a electron into um, the conduction band to simulate charge carrier cooling dynamics um, and um, got the results for um, the cooling times. 
Um, and then in um, quantum dots, there are multiple exciton generations. Um, and that happens when um, a photon excites um, multiple electron hole pairs um, from a single excitation um, uh, by using photo photons with energies um, exceeding the band gap. And so multi-exciton generation is uh, another strategy to maximize solar cell efficiency. Um, and so these graphs show an atomistic model of the um, uh, methyl uh, ammonium perovskite quantum dot, and then uh, multi-electron generation and recombination rates as functions of the ratio of the initial excitation energy to the band gap. Um, so simulation showed that uh, multi-electron generation is the fastest process um, occurring on a femtosecond time scale um, compared to the picosecond um, carrier cooling and nanosecond um, radiative, non-radiative um, carrier recombination. Um, and the MEG was demonstrated to be the dominant pathway of carrier dynamics um, at early times. Um, in addition, the MEG rate was found um, dependent on the excitation energy. Um, the energy threshold um, required to generate any type of um, MEG process in the methyl ammonium perovskite um, quantum, um, quantum dot is um, twice the quantum dot band gap. Any questions about this one? So just based on what you said, yep. so why is there, or so the threshold you have to meet is two times the band gap? Mm -hmm. But then why is there a little peak below? Mm -hmm. Good question. Because you, yeah, you would expect that it would be flat until it hits two EV. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, let's ask Amir. Um, Amir, would you would you please comment on uh, your vision of the uh, green line uh, at the bottom? So, Aaron is um, asking why it goes below. 2.0. Uh, can you repeat the question? I didn't fo follow this slide. Uh. So, um, the process that is described by green line uh -huh. may happen only if energy is above 2.0. It's it's a uh, Otherwise, it, 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 can, it can go. But the figure shows some non-zero signal at the energy lower than 2.0. Is there any interpretations or any uh, uh, suggestions how to, how to think and speak about it? Uh. You, you mean finding a way to improve this kind of results or no? No, 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 not to improve. Um, assume that both theorem is correct and results here are correct. How to make them to agree? Mm. I'm asking this question to you because in your paper, you were computing band gap, not as distance between peaks, but as distance between first appearance of non-zero signal. You did increase thermal broadening uh, into your evaluation of band gap. So, yeah, I cannot understand the connection between this and my results. So for the band gap, actually we did the calculation between the peaks, right? However, we uh, observed that from the first peak of the transition between the Okay. Actually, absorption between the energy levels. For instance, the first peak corresponds to the right, yeah. right, and the peak should correspond to the actual value of energy. But if you look on the on the broadening, there is a non-zero um, 
recordings, non-zero visual appearance at energies below that uh, energy difference between peaks? Uh, yes. Oh. So it can be an um, either artifact of this artificial broadening, or it can be um, consequence of uncertainty of, of energy. Like if we uh, energy times time should be Planck constant, and if the measurements are made on the on the short time, then it gives some width, natural width to to the line. Uh, could be uh, could be also maybe because of just uh, gamma point calculation. For instance, if somebody repeat the calculation with sampling the results, should be expected to have a similar trend or no? Um, so, my, my, my understanding uh, is uh, the answer to Aaron's question would be just artificial line broadening, nothing else. Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard to say because there aren't any ticks on the x-axis, but even just drawing a straight line from like where the peak is down, it seems to intersect lower than uh, where the so it's, it could just be ambiguity. But uh, it, is, it is a, li a little confusion when, uh, so we do artificial line broadening for um, situations when there are so many energy levels that they can be observed uh, individually. But then for individual lines at, at the range where density is small, it creates this um, how do say, confusion that there are states at some energies where there are no energies if our width parameter is big. OK, yeah, thank you for the discussion. And uh, Boston, sorry for interrupting you. Please, okay. please go ahead. Um, and so. Um, lastly, when <laughs> the most of the above studies um, have ignored relativistic effects, um, and which are expected to be um, pretty prominent in systems that contain heavy elements like lead. Um, consideration of these effects um, requires explicit incorporation of spin or orbit coupling into calculations. Um, it has been reported that um, spin orbit coupling influences the electronic properties of the perovskites. Um, and so, for example, on the right here, we have the average absolute um, non adiabatic coupling in um, the methyl ammonium perovskite um, with and without spin and orbit coupling. And so these studies showed that the spin and orbit coupling reduced the band gap by nearly one electron volt. Um, and moreover, the spin and orbit coupling changes the wave function characteristics, um, enhancing um, the comp contribution of the px and py orbitals of the lead atoms to the conduction band and valence band. Um, and the non adiabatic coupling is significantly increased in the presence of the spin orbit coupling. Um, and so as a result, electron and hole cooling um, rates are increased, so, which is just more of a concern for um, simulation um, methods. Um, it, if, if you're not using spin orbit coupling, just keep in mind some of your results might um, be off. Uh, Boston? Yep. Um, how does this uh, observation matches or contradicts uh, to what Aaron reported on his uh, thesis defense? And uh, what is the feature, what is the aspect to, to make them to agree? If you were listening to to Aaron's uh, either practice talk or actual defense, well, it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I didn't see your actual defense. Um, I can't quite remember. So um, um, let, let me bring it up, and then you, you try to match the things, and uh, Aaron will help if, if needed. So. 
which system is considered here? Which uh, form of perovskite? Um, the methyl ammonium. But is it uh, nanostructure or periodic bulk? Um, uh, nanostructure. Which nanostructure? What is the uh, shape and size? Uh, quantum dot, um, less than um, 100 nanometers in all directions. What, what, what it is written, uh, are you sure? Uh, I think so. It was in that section um, that said maybe I was wrong with that. But, but let's double check. I can pull up the paper real quick. Yeah, so um, it might have been bulk. Okay. I just, I just assumed it was the a quantum dot because it was in. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. It's Okay, so it is bulk, and uh, they are telling that uh, spin orbit coupling will speed up the relaxation. Mm -hmm. So Aaron did consider perovskite quantum dot, and he found that uh, spin orbit coupling substantially slows down the relaxation. Okay. So it seems, on the first glance, it seems contradictory. Mm -hmm. So how to match uh, these two observations, assuming then that they both are correct? Um, I'm not sure how that- You told all words like uh, needed all components of the explanation during your during your presentation. So we, we do not need to know anything which can just borrow uh, thoughts and words from your presentation. <laughs> so what, what does quantum confinement uh, does to energy levels? Um, Are they denser or sparse? Yeah. Uh, or sparser? Uh, denser. If system is quantum confined if there are if the uh, there are a smaller piece of material would the energy levels be denser or sparser um uh sparser okay and um any interaction including spin orbit interaction does it bring levels closer or it repels it if you just solve for uh, two level system with off diagonal element. So, any off diagonal uh, interaction does it make levels closer or pulls them uh, away from each other? Further. Okay. And then the next chain uh, relaxation between uh, denser orbitals or sparser orbitals is uh, quicker. Um sparse or denser orbitals are quicker okay so it looks like if the spin orbit uh, coupling uh, splits the levels in the valence and conduction band further away from each other if they are already sparser due to quantum confinement and spin orbit coupling make them even sparser and it uh, it is expected to slow down the relaxation mm -hmm. Uh, Aaron, would you is it is it correct interpretation of your result? Yeah, I would say so. And uh, how you would uh, interpret why in the bulk uh, spin orbit coupling makes it quicker? If it is so. Um, well, they have closer density of state, so that makes it faster, and then. You compare the G and H panels, mm -hmm. you see that the purple spreads out a lot further, including spin orbit coupling. Mm -hmm. So it 
basically just increases the chance of a non-radiative relaxation. So interaction mixes larger number of uh, basis states. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Boston, would you agree with? Yeah, it, it makes sense. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry for interrupting, Chris. Oh, no, it's, uh, we're, we're pretty much at the end here. Um, so just the, the general outlook that um, the, the paper wanted to get across was that the perovskites, they continue to show great promise um, as a potential material for use in um, solar cell technologies. Um, the many studies um, looked at in this paper um, demonstrate some of the many useful properties, some of the drawbacks that they have, and then um, methods to optimize their performance. Um, and then it also talked about some TD, DFT, and um, NAMD simulations um, um, and their integral aspect in the study of um, these materials. And then it also made some points on how some of the methods still need to be refined and improved on to speed up both computational time and accuracy. Um, and so that's about it. Oh, okay, please uh, join me thanking uh, Boston. And thank, thank you for spending two hours with me. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> thank you for.